Hello, everyone. And inside today is locked on Canadians. The NHL is considering Spursman is back in the GM hunt. And is Cole Caulfield in danger of an offer sheet? We'll discuss all that and more inside today's show. Locked on Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 850 of Locked on Canadians. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKDOWNNHL for $20 off your first purchase. We are, of course, your daily Montreal Canadiens podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, where you get your team every single daily podcast, SiriusXM, or if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe there as well. I am one of your hosts. I am Scott Mell, and I'm joined, as always, by the active stick, Laura Saba. And Laura, before we get into the Mark Bergevin potential news and the Cole Caulfield speculation, the NHL wants to make the season longer, mostly despite people who have a five days a week podcast. And I'm curious, uh, before we dive into that, how are you feeling about that? How are you feeling today? It honestly depends on how good your team is, to be honest, because I find that when the Canadians are good and fun and exciting, I can't get enough. I know a lot of people complain that the season's too long already, the playoffs stretch out into the summer, blah, 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 blah. But when the Canadians are good, I want to see as much of them as I possibly can. And you know that in what, even if they do make the playoffs, you know that it could be over in one round and you know, you're missing them for another couple of months while the rest of the teams play out. It could be over in two rounds. But when your team is bad, when your team is like this year or last year, I would have wanted the season to be over in 48 (laughs) games, if that. But I think it does open the door kind of a little bit to changing the way they do the draft lottery, to be honest. Because if you remove the incentive to tank and instead what happens is they will go 84 games, but at the end of the year, once you're eliminated from playoff contention, your point percentage, like this is not a new idea. This is not radical thing that I'm post um, I'm proposing, but if they do it in such a way where even after they've eliminated, they've been eliminated from the playoffs, teams are still working really hard to win. Uh, I think, you, you know, there's, there's an argument to be made that the 84 game season does not become as much of a grind as it ordinarily would be. If you're being rewarded for, um, you know, with a higher draft lo- with higher draft lottery odds, the worse you are. The weird part about this is that, uh, and this comes from Russian Machine Never Break, where uh, is where I saw the news earlier, is that the NHLPAs are g- reportedly willing to talk about an expanded 84 game schedule if the league agrees to higher than expected salary cap. This whole thing feels like a very weird negotiation, and the thing about this is. The preseason's too long in a lot of cases. Like the Canadians played, what, eight preseason games last year? It's too many. And then you're going to add on two more games, which the Canadians then would have played almost a hundred games. And if they made the playoffs, would play close to a hundred games. That's insanity to me. Because we talk about the quality of hockey and putting the best product out there. My thought is, why not? Re- I get that revenue is based off the amount of played. And it seems like a point that if they reduce the games, you're going to get better quality hockey out of it because players will have more rest, more time between games and everything. I don't know if I love adding two more games on. And admittedly, my thoughts on that are based on, I don't want to watch what's left of the Montreal Canadiens play hockey for an 83rd and 84th game. It was a struggle to get through 82 when they were even, I'm not even going to say they were healthy for any of it. I think they had a fully healthy lineup like three times all year. I don't know if I love 84 games though, just because it feels like now we're dragging the season longer. We're putting it into the time when there's the draft and everything else and into free agency and it gets pushed back. And then that means the next season is starting closer to the end of the last one there. Unless you condense the regular season schedule and have guys playing three and three weekends like they do in the AHL. I just think that 
we've seen so many injuries. And yes, again, this is based off of watching the Canadians a couple for the past couple of years. You've got guys that just never have recuperated because they haven't had the time to do so after these seasons. And I get why they want to have that cap go up. So their players can get played more. That is what the PA should be advocating for is better working conditions, better pay, et cetera, for their players. I just don't know if 84 games is the way to go about that. And I worry about the quality of hockey, the potential injuries, and just guys not being as rested going into the next season. And maybe I'm crazy. It's not that I don't want to watch more hockey. I love watching hockey when I get the chance to. But it feels like we're jamming too much into a time frame that doesn't really call for it at this point. And I forgot to undo my mute button before I started talking. I said that's exactly it because jamming a bunch of hockey that is that nobody wants to see into a, a shorter or into the same amount of time. Honestly, I just I know it's only two games, but the season should be shorter as it is when you're dragging along, you know, when when and and the reality is that most teams have up and down seasons, right? So on the one hand, you do have more of a chance to recuperate after or to uh, make up for, let's say, a losing streak or, um, you know, a slump or something like that. Like it gives you more opportunity to correct that path. But I still think at the end of the day, that's only 84 games is only really viable if somebody wants to watch the product. And how many teams can you honestly say every year? are worth really watching every night. And, and I think you're right on that, is that it's also, it's expensive for fans. Like, how much more season tickets going to cost if you're adding? And maybe it's one game on the road, one game at home. Who? Because uh, it's balanced 41 and 41, so obviously they can't do, there's no point in making an 83-game season. But also, ask yourselves, and I'm asking Leaf fans, I'm asking Senators fans, I'm asking whomever, do you really want to see the Montreal Canadiens that often again? The Canadians played the Senators, what, four this year, plus three or four times in the preseason. They played the Leafs three times in the preseason. All due respect to these rivalries or the Senators being whatever that is, I don't want to see you that often. I, I'm sorry, I don't. And they would probably add a divisional game for that. It's just, it doesn't add what I think they want it to. And we'll see how far this goes because... Obviously, COVID had an impact on the salary cap, and they are trying to get that back to the projectable levels they were understanding. And you know what? Great. Let people get paid. Let people spend money. Get the league back to the path it was on before COVID hit, which is not the fault of the NHL. But I don't know about 84 the thing here. And to kind of shift things a little bit off of that, GM searches are heating up, no pun intended to the Calgary Flames, around the NHL, and there's a pair of former Canadians' names tied into that, and we're going to dive into what that means for those teams and what it means potentially for the Montreal Canadiens coming up in our next segment. But first, as I mentioned off the top of the show, today's show is brought to you by Game Time. If you're like me, you sometimes are like, I need something to do, and at the last minute you decide to go see a game, you decide to go to a show, any kind of event where you need tickets for that, and it becomes stressful to try and find the best possible ticket to get in the building, let alone finding great seats. And let me tell you, Game Time has you covered on everything for that because it is no longer stressful. And you're going to get killer deals on last minute tickets with their best price guarantee. So you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for all the fun you're going to have. They've got flash deals and last minute tickets. Easy to find and buy tickets for any kind of event in your area. And you can get images from your seats so you know exactly where you are going to be sitting and what it's going to look like. Guaranteed, they have event cancellation policies, job loss protection, and everything else and for months in advance. All you got to do, download the Game Time app, use promo code Locked on NHL, and you're going to get $20 off your first order. Some terms apply. Again, create an account at Game Time on the Game Time app. Use code Locked on NHL for $20 off. And remember to download Game Time today. Last-minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. We are back here at Locked On Canadians. We are, of course, your daily Montreal Canadiens podcast. We have a very fun event to announce to you all in the near future here. It will be before the NHL draft. It will be 
after the combine though, which I am hoping to get my approval for this week. We've got a really fun guest lined up. We're going to come hang out, can ask all kinds of draft questions ahead of that. You're not going to want to miss it. But if we're getting back into what y'all came here for, the GM search is heating up across the NHL at this point. Some have found their GM, Craig, now the GM of the Calgary Flames, with apparently Dave Nonis as his number two. And that is not a poop joke. That is actually what Dave Nonis is. He is his assistant because his interview was very impressive, apparently, which I say there's an article comparing Dave Nonis to a potato. Anyways, around the NHL since the GM searches have started after Bredge for Living left and other people have left their posts or were fired or had a messy breakup on the way out from <clears throat> Toronto, we've seen coming up a lot in these searches is that teams want someone with a little bit of experience and we keep seeing the name of former Montreal Canadiens general manager Mark Bergevin and Toronto is the latest one where his name is cropped up for an interview. I believe he popped up in the Calgary interviews. I want to say also in Philadelphia, the Penguins are apparently have interviewed him as well. And now Toronto may be on his radar as well, along with Scott Mellenby in Toronto, which I got to be honest, I did not expect to see Mark Bergevin back in a potential NHL front office so quickly. Uh, not even related to the Logan Mayu drafting, just because I thought, Man needed some time away from that main spot there because the job in Montreal aged him 30, 40 years by the end of that Stanley Cup run. Honestly, I feel like once you've been at the reins, you probably can't wait to get back in the saddle. Like it is a high stress job. But if you go from that to being a special advisor or consultant or, you know, fishing or whatever, it must be a huge loss in your life to have. Um, you know, to have downtime like that. So I wouldn't necessarily be surprised that he might want to be or he might be interested in interviewing. But here's the thing, like, I'm going to go back not just to the Logan Mayu thing. He did release a statement that he said that he was unaware of what was going on with the Kyle Beach situation back in Chicago. Uh, but, you know, the more that comes out about that, and the more that gets swept under the rug about that, um, the more it becomes clear that people knew what was going on and how did he not hear at all being part of the organization at that time. He kept insisting that he didn't know. We even talked about it. We're like, we don't know. He, he released a statement, blah, blah, blah. There's nothing tying him there. But he was part of that. And then the way that he handled the Logan Mayu thing, not even the, the drafting him when Logan Mayu said he didn't want to be drafted, uh, but also instead of being the one to take ownership of it, throwing Trevor Timmons out there to be the face of that decision. I don't know that that's, you know, that's something that people want to see in their general manager. Like I would have not done that. Um, you know, and, and the ultimately, yes, there is the head of, you know, whoever the head of your scouting decisions is, whoever the bottom line is with your scouting decision, decisions, but you are still the general manager and you still sign off and veto on decisions like that. So I don't, you know, the way that he handled that doesn't necessarily, you know, scream to me, excellent manager. Obviously with, in Montreal, he had varying degrees of success. We've talked a lot about his track record. You know, he was too married to his coaches he was too married to grit, not enough on skill. He did take some risks and those paid off. It was a very mixed bag. We, you know, the Canadians got to a Stanley Cup final under him. Yes, that's true. They also, you know, they got to see, they got to see quite a bit uh, of, of fun playoff runs. But at the end of the day, he didn't bring a cup to Montreal and he didn't set the team up for success to the point where now they're in a rebuild. So... I don't know that that's a great track record as a manager. So I, I I get why he wants to be back in the game. I don't understand why other teams are interviewing him. My thing with the whole he didn't win Stanley Cup thing is, and I say this about Kyle Dubas right now too, is that it is very hard to win a Stanley Cup. It is extremely hard. You need a combination of good luck and great players and so many things. It is hard to win a Stanley Cup. I cannot necessarily hold that against Mark Bergevin. Just the same that I wouldn't hold it against every other GM potentially. But at the same time, I look at this. If you were a team and you were going to be getting Mark Bergevin, unless he has changed his 
perception and the way that he reacts to things at the as an NHL GM, you're going to get a lot of reactionary things. You're not going to get a lot of proactive movement on things. We look at his moves. We look at that series against Ottawa in 2013. His response was reactionary. They drafted Michael McCarr. They traded for George Paris, Douglas Murray, all these things, and they didn't help the team. And then sometimes he pulls Thomas Vanek out of his hat, and it's great until the coach that he is married to doesn't know what to do because Thomas Vanek's in a little bit of a shooting slump. And then he pulls Jeff Petrie out of nowhere, and by that I mean Edmonton, and he gets him for almost a decade of great play. He, like every GM, has his great moves, and I will not deny that he got Nick Suzuki in that Max Pacioretty deal and Thomas Tatar, who ended up being great as well. And then he has things where he loses Philip Deneau over $500,000 and lets Kotkaniemi walk. If you get him, if he were to go, and I'm just saying this, I'm not saying this is where he's going to go. If he ends up in Toronto, he's going to be walking into a situation with a team that plays at a 100-point pace with a mediocre to middling coach in Sheldon Keefe. There is, I would be shocked if he went in there and actively made that team a not playoff team. I would be stunned. And he will get accolades, especially if they win a round with ease again, despite the fact that we know the team can do this. I'm really interested to see where he might end up, if he does anywhere. Because uh, Pittsburgh, who knows? They were apparently given permission to talk to Kyle Dubas today, which we're just going to keep that saga just right on rolling down the road here. There's enough smoke around his name, though, that if he doesn't get hired in this immediate round of things, when someone gets fired inevitably in the upcoming season, I wouldn't be shocked if he's the first one on that list to go to a team there. And this isn't say he had his good moments as Canadians GM. I don't want people to think that his entire time here was a bust. That it could have been better. And hindsight is 2020 in that regard. But he had his moments, and I do think I would be interested to see what he would do with a team like Toronto. I, if even Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh is a team loaded with veterans, guys Mark Bergevin loves, that's for sure. Two different situations, though. Pittsburgh's in a little bit of both are in cap spots, but it'd be interesting to see what Mark Bergevin can do with that. Uh, I'm curious what the other people's thoughts are. Are they surprised to see Mark Bergevin back in the GM seat so soon? Because we thought for sure he's going to hang out in LA until either Rob Blake gets fired or he gets promoted but here we are um laura do you have any more parting thoughts on that before we go into our final segment no i pretty much agree with you i think i think it's interesting i think he'll get success if he if he inherits toronto uh pittsburgh is a bit of a bigger question because uh, just before we started recording it seems the smoke is more and more around eric telski of the, of the carolina hurricanes uh somebody who's a delightful person incredibly intelligent mind um, and that's going to be really interesting to see what happens there. But I just, for me, I just think that, you know, going from Kyle Dubas to Mark Bergevin isn't necessarily going to be the right move if that's the way they go. Yeah, that's, it's very interesting to see. Do they, do they go the, the younger, not younger, but I mean younger, but the more new age route with an Eric Tulski or someone like Hermanos, who's been doing a good job in Buffalo that Sabres fans maybe don't want him to go. Or did they go Mark Bergman? Do they go uh, Scott Mellenby? I mean, Dave Nonis just got hired again. Anything is possible, the good and the bad in that regard. So we will obviously keep an eye on that and continue talking about it. However, speculation time. Cole Caulfield still isn't signed. Are we afraid of an offer sheet? What about a deal that one of our listeners sent to us in an email? We're going to get into all that coming up next. We are back here at Locked on Canadians. So it is May 22nd at 6.59 p.m. Eastern. Cole Caulfield has not signed an extension or, as far as I know, been offered an extension by the Montreal Canadiens. And now, Laura, we, we've discussed this. We all think he's going to be signing here in the near future. I don't think either of us are afraid of that not being a thing. Are you afraid of an offer sheet? I'll be really honest with you. I think it's not out of the realm of possibility. I think it's unlikely. But I think that we do need to kind of think about what the Canadians are going to have to give up if they 
um, if they don't have a coal caulfield in their future. Sorry, what the Canadians are going to have to do to replace coal caulfield if they don't want if they don't have one in their future. Uh, I think so. I, I do want to point out this is a listener proposal that was sent to us and it is the off season. There is nothing going on. So if you want us to discuss things, please suggest them like Christian G has, because we really appreciate these topic ideas and anything goes. It is the off season. Tell us what you want to hear. And this one was a good one. Scott, do you want to read the, the potential offer sheet? Uh, I think, I think there was a silver lining in that email. <laughs> yes. So here is this uh, from Christian G. It says, I will get hate, but I live for it. So here we go. One, love your attitude. Be chaotic always. Hypothetically, Philadelphia offer sheets Cole Caulfield. And there are two possibilities. Over 10 and a half, over seven years. That equals four first round picks. And then nine million times seven years equals two first, one second, two thirds. I believe uh, that is in Christian's thing. Someone can fact check us on that. If this year's Philly pick is included, which it would be, it would be seventh, and then also next year's. Now that means we could pick two of these: Mishkov, Smith, Leonard, Benson, Jaeger. And I hate to say this, Rhinebacker. Not that he say not that he's bad. It's just a safe pick. I believe those are players. Sorry if I missed any other players, which who knows with the draft, there could be anybody in there. And just remember, Philly has to make the playoffs LMAO. Do you match Caulfield at nine to $10 million over seven years? Then if not, maybe we can trade for Bedard now. Ha ha. Just kidding. Maybe I believe that's it. Have a great night. The biggest part of this is that it becomes a, I don't want to say a test, but a, where is the line in the sand when it comes to a Cole Caulfield contract? If the cap had gone up, like it was in, like we had talked about a little bit over uh, originally in the first segment, is if this had gone up seven or eight million dollars from this offseason forward, okay, I can see giving Caulfield a little bit more money. The fact of the matter is, it has not. It's going up, I think, maybe a million if you're lucky. I, I'm wondering that if you're going to get four first round picks, I'm tempted to say I take it, but my line in the sand is probably around eight and a half million a year for Caulfield right now, just because he has that weird half season, which we realize is a Dominique Ducharme thing. And he was injured last year. The, the sample size around Cole Caulfield is not large. We know he is great in that sample size. This is not to disparage Cole Caulfield sample size in there. I just worry so much. If you're giving him $10 million, are you going to leaf yourself and you're not going to have enough cap to sign the supporting cast there? You do not give Cole Caulfield $10 million a year. I love Cole Caulfield. I absolutely adore Cole Caulfield. He some days is the reason that it's worth being a Canadians fans in the last couple of years. It's been really rough, right? I would not give him anything north of $9 million and $9 million is pushing it only if there's an offer sheet. Now, if you're the Philadelphia Flyers, do not listen to what I'm saying right now. Go away. Close your ears. (laughs) Go look at Cam York. If you're the Montreal Canadiens, though, I I honestly feel like he should come in at around eight and a half million uh, up to 9 million. And I don't I, I want it to be less than 9 million. I think that. As a lot of people have pointed out, you can't tie up that much cap space in one person or two people. If you look at him and Nick Suzuki as a, as a duo, you can't tie up that kind of cap, like $18 million you'd be talking about if you gave him $10 million. Like it's not, it's not okay. It's like, it's, it's, it's not, I guess it's not an efficient, it's not a smart way to run a team. It's not a smart way to manage your cap. I think also the other thing too, is that if you look at other players who are making $10 million or more, they're better than Cole Caulfield as much as I love him. And I, and I really, really do. Now the people who are saying he's not even worth 8 million. Uh, I disagree with You're you. Wrong. There's, You're wrong. There's some haters. <laughs> there are some haters that think, you know, he's small and that that means anything. It doesn't, it's not your size. It's what you do with it. Um, and Cole Caulfield is very smart about the way that he uses his size. He's very agile. He skates between people. He skates through people. You can't get him off the puck, even though he's tiny. 
I don't, I don't, I don't see his size as a reason not to pay him. I look at his skill. The one big question mark that I have, and this is the thing that the fear that I actually do have is not that there's going to be an offer sheet. It's that there's going to be a bridge deal because of the shoulder and they want to see how that plays out. And I don't like that because if you give him a bridge deal right now, you are going to be paying 10 or more million dollars two or three years down the line. And that's not what I want I'm, with Cole Caulfield as much as I love him. Like with, with that offer sheet, I look at that and go, that is a lot of tools to rebuild. Can you find your Cole Caulfield replacement in there and develop them so that when you are ready to contend, you have him there? Which admittedly also, it makes the Canadians infinitely more boring to not have Cole Caulfield on the team. I always want Cole Caulfield on this team here. I'm wondering if they go somewhere in the middle and I'm talking like four or five years versus seven or eight and not a bridge deal, which is what, two Two years, years, give or take. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, the, the, there's two different questions. It's how much do you think Cole Caulfield is worth, and up to what amount do you match if the Flyers do what they do, and if it's that much and you're getting that much in return, exactly like you pointed out and our listener Christian pointed out, that's a chance to replace Cole Caulfield and then some. You get, you can get your number one defenseman or number two, depending on how Kane Gooley shakes out. You can get all these people for that number of draft picks and and that high level draft picks right so i think for me the question is would you let it get to the point where an offer sheet is even possible you got to sign him before no, july 1st but, right no uh, june 26th yeah. what's the what's the rfa deadline i can double check on that but my thought is get him signed before the draft starts yes. uh to be quite honest with you don't because give anyone any don't let it get to that point and also for since we're using the Flyers as an example here, remember the Flyers could have just drafted Cole Caulfield and they didn't. And they picked Cam York, which is very funny, mind you. So uh, tell us your thoughts on where do you draw the line at Cole Caulfield's next contract in terms of dollar amount? Tweet us at LO underscore Canadians on Twitter, lockdown Canadians at gmail.com in our comments. Just don't be a jerk. If someone disagrees with you, it's a pretty simple thing. Follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Canadians. Of course, follow myself at Scott Mella. Follow Laura at The Active Stick. And folks, we will see you all next time.